right, let's take a look at the poem An African Thunderstorm. Uh, a little bit about our poet David. He was born in 1930 in Malawi. In 1964, he became Malawi's first ambassador to the United States and the United Nations. He left the government in 1965 when he and the president at the time, President Hastings Banda, had a disagreement. But he later returned to the Washington embassy after the president's removal from power. So, the poem is in fact about a thunderstorm in Africa, which is just great, okay, because it means that, I've even written here, the diction is simple and clear, it means that the heading, the title, is in fact reflective of the content of the poem. It's not one of those poems where you've got to try and figure out what the hell the poem actually means. The language is pretty simple. So you read it, you can understand the literal sense of what's happening. Now, we are going to focus on it being an actual thunderstorm in Africa. And the fact that this thunderstorm is approaching and the fear that it invokes and when it eventually arrives, the destruction that it starts causing. Okay. If we do want to get technical and we want to think uh, another interpretation, we could say that um, it's an effect of colonial domination on the native land because the time in which this poet lived, um, Malawi achieved independence in the early 1960s. So we could say, okay, maybe we can accept that interpretation. Because also he talks about, um, in the last stanza, the tattered flags, uh, which could have a nationalistic connotation. So there is a little bit of evidence that we can use. But like I say, we're going to focus on it being a literal thunderstorm. All right, look at the structure of the poem. We can see that it's free verse. And if we had to give an explanation as to why is it free verse, well, the fact that the wind is free-flowing would be quite a nice explanation. I mean, if you think about the strong winds now that have been created because of this pressure gradient um, and all that, then you would notice that, um, okay, well, the wind's not going to be like blowing at, I don't know, 80 k's an hour continuously. That's not how wind works, all right? It comes in gusts, it changes direction, um, so it's irregular. So the lines are irregularly shaped to show that the wind kind of has a mind of its own um, and it's not rigid. Even the stanzas themselves contain a different number of lines. Okay, so this thunderstorm is coming from the west. So the poet is saying in Malawi, or in the setting of this poem, the thunderstorms are coming from the west. Clouds come hurrying. I suppose there could be clouds come alliteration. You're not going to worry too much about that right now. Um, come hurrying with the wind. So the wind and the, the upwelling of air is creating these thund thunderous clouds, you know, these cumulonimbus clouds and the anvil and all that. And they're strong winds. And so the clouds are coming hurrying towards the speaker now, in a sense, or in the context of the, of the poem, um, coming from the west. They're coming quickly. Thunderstorms develop pretty quickly. I mean, a cold front can take its time, you know. Uh, to move, but a thunderstorm moves quite rapidly. Turning sharply here and there. Now, the wind is turning sharply here and there. Yes, because like I said, the wind doesn't just flow from point A to point B. B. It kind of just blows around and uh, creates little whirls and stuff. Okay, so it's irregularly shaped. This word here and this word there. Here and there means like here and there. Here and there irregular okay we can also say that the shape of the clouds is irregular i mean these clouds are nice like insert clip art nice shape clouds okay they're irregularly shaped because of this upwelling of air and you can talk about all the different types of clouds and all that but generally like the clouds have like little spiky bits and a, a, a high um, length going up into a nice flat anvil at the top and all that if you want to think about a nice picturesque thunderous cloud but I mean clouds are irregularly shaped in, at any given time okay now the wind and these clouds are like a plague of locusts now if you think about a plague of locusts that's like my worst nightmare and many others I'm sure it's going to be like a dark mass that's coming towards you and you can't tell that it's a plague of locusts from a distance because it's you just a black movement coming along but it's moving quickly and the locusts will literally decimate everything in their path so if you have a land of crops there they will just chow it all 
Okay, so it's moving quickly and it's devastating. Just like the storm. Moving quickly, hurrying, and it's devastating. Whirling, tossing up things on its tail like a man mad chasing nothing. A thunderstorm is um, intimidating and it doesn't seem to flow any log you know, follow any logical pattern. Uh, a cloud will just form suddenly out of nowhere and it, the storm might change direction. And of course, whirling and tossing up uh, things on its tail, like you can think about all the leaves um, and the dirt and the sand and the branches and whatever that have been thrown up all over the place and maybe lifted off the ground because of these strong winds. Okay, and he's comparing that to a madman chasing nothing. All right, and I've written here no apparent destination, haphazard, erratic. If you think about some a madman running around, he's he does he's like cooked in his head. He doesn't know what he's doing. He's just running here and there and everywhere. So. Um, yeah, if you think about the poem Sunstrike, where the guy's digging for gold and diamonds and that, in, although he's actually just looking for water at that time, uh, it talks about him digging sporadically. Um, it's a similar thing here, you know, like here, there, you know, no fixed kind of uh, pattern. Okay, second stanza. Pregnant clouds. The clouds have been personified here. Um, they're pregnant because they're holding all this water. Okay, uh, it's not raining yet, so they haven't given birth to the rain yet. Ride stately on its back, gathering to perch on hills like sinister dark wings. Okay, so here come these looming black clouds, and they're quite low because they're full of water. All right, and they're going to be gathering to perch on hills. So if you think of a mountain. Because this cloud is so heavy, it's so low that it actually is like at the same height as the peak of a mountain. So it's almost as if it's going to be perched on top of this mountain. Okay, Like sinister dark wings. Sinister, evil. Um, and then of course wings probably because of the shape of the cloud. It's got quite a, a large expanse so it looks like wings and of course it's dark because they are dark clouds. Okay. Now, um, that line there, and that simile, I've put here vultures, like vultures are pretty evil things, um, or like they're ugly things, and they like wait for animals and people to die so they can go and eat them, all right. Or we could talk about some supernatural demons here, we don't know, but the, the fact of the matter is, is that the poet is successful in describing the storm by saying that, listen, it's a bad thing and it's coming quickly All right I didn't speak about it here but this whirling tossing the ending in ING here these present participles um, it almost makes the movement seem like it's happening right now okay I've even written here that irregular line length conveys the unpredictability of the storm okay moving on some more alliteration here the wind whistles by um, that W sound kind of mimics the sound of wind whistling through the trees and, and the leaves and stuff. Okay, so this wind is whistling by and trees bend to let it pass. Now, if you think about all these trees, when the wind comes, the trees are going to just like bend to give way. All right. What the poet is saying there is that even a tree, which is pretty solid most of the time, is not going to stop the storm. It's as if the tree is saying, well, hang on just a second, uh, don't worry, I'll move out your way. Um, there, off you go, I'm not going to try and stop you. Okay, It's almost like the tree is now bowing to the king, because the wind and the storm is so powerful that even the tree knows not to try and stop it. Okay, So the tree and nature is recognizing that there's a greater force in, in nature on its way. Third stanza, in the village. Okay, so these first two stanzas are all about the storm and its approach. Describing the wind, describing the clouds, etc. Now we get to the third stanza where it's like, okay, what is happening on the ground um, before this storm has reached there completely? In the village, screams of delighted children toss and turn in the din of the whirling wind. Okay. Now, I don't think they're necessarily delighted because they can see a thunderstorm coming. 
um, although they are completely oblivious probably to what the thunderstorm means. But they're just having a nice time, you know, they're just enjoying life, playing around in the dirt and stuff, okay. They don't know like the worries of the world, okay. So they're just screaming, um, having fun. And they're tossing and turning and again there we can see uh, some more alliteration in the din of the whirling wind a din is like an unrecognizable sound okay if you think about a lot of people talking all at once you can't actually hear any distinctive sound so the din of the whirling wind it's not like the same sound all the time okay because the wind travels through trees and around uh, houses and stuff so it's like irregular and then even there we have more alliteration whirling wind woman okay babies clinging on their backs dart about in and out okay so you see these lines here are running into each other okay we call that enjambment okay enjambment present e n j a m b m e n t okay which we know are run-on lines okay um, so the woman obviously very aware of what this thunderstorm approaching means and babies clinging on their backs and I've put their image of Africa you know so if we had to ask you um, quote a line or explain why this storm or this poem you know the setting of this poem is in Africa except for the title obviously what evidence is there in the poem that suggests that this setting is in Africa um, you can talk about a village but that's not really uh, very applicable you get villages all over the place so this baby is clinging on their backs that's very much an, an African culture okay now these women are darting about in and out madly these short lines here create the image of the wind's haphazard movement and the fact that the, the women are moving so quickly because now they're trying to get their children inside or get the washing off the line and things like that um, because they know what's coming. Dart about in and out madly. The wind whistles by whilst trees bend to let it pass. So we've got a similar thing to stanza 2 here except instead of and they've used whilst okay nothing really to say about that okay it's just a change but again showing that the trees are saying hang on we're not gonna stop you don't worry last stanza clothes wave like tattered flags the wind is so strong that you can imagine flags that are all frayed and that okay or tattered flapping around in the wind that's what their clothes are doing and the effect of that is to create disorder the storm is so powerful that anything that's in its path is at the mercy of the storm, including people. So much so, this wind, that uh, the clothes actually fly off the people. Fly off the woman with the babies clinging on their backs, probably to expose dangling breasts as jagged blind... Okay, to expose dangling breasts. That is what the wind is doing because the clothes are off. And then... As jagged, blinding flashes rumble, tremble, and crack amidst the smell of fire, smoke, and the pelting mobs of the rain. Okay. The jagged, blinding flashes, that's obviously the lightning, and stereotypically have that jagged shape. And rumble, tremble, crack, those are all words that represent a sound. So that's onomatopoeia. Make sure you spell it correctly. Uh, pigs only eat ink apples. Okay. At this point, the storm has now arrived. Okay. It's overhead. Amidst the smell of fired smoke and the pelting march of the storm. Alright, the smell of fired smoke, um, the lightning's probably striking trees and that, and it's actually burning the land. And the pelting, now the pelting means like relentless, okay. So it's raining hard. Now if you've ever been stuck in a rainstorm, you'll know that it doesn't give a damn about whether you want it to rain or not. It's relentless, okay. And it's a march of the storm. If you think about an army, like a troop, marching towards you over the mountain, that's very intimidating. And it's like, okay, it's a force to be reckoned with. So the poet is trying to say the storm that's coming is unstoppable and it's intimidating. So it's like, okay, let's say it's marching. 
and I suppose that's a personification as well, isn't it? Okay. I've also said here that crack is a short sound. Crack is a word, one syllable, crack. Okay. So that mimics the sharp sound that is created from the thunder. And lastly, um, imagery appeals to the senses I've put here. So this is all about creating an image in our minds, which I spoke about earlier. So well done to the, the poet. Obviously, he was uh, successful in doing that for us because I'm sure we've all got an image in our mind of what's happening. And last thing I'm going to say is that the dissipation of the storm's arrival is both exciting and frightening with the dominating one being frightening, of course, because, it, of, because I mean, the, the people on the land um, in the path of the storm can all see what's coming. And, well, we hear exactly what happens and um, the ladies are darting about in and out and the storm is no doubt so destructive that it actually rips the clothes off the people and we have quite violent words there as well to describe the storm okay so as i said the poem is divided into two parts which divide the content into the general and the specific so the first part is made up of the first two stanzas which describes the storm um, as it gathers momentum and then the third stanza describes its impact on on the humans below so in other words you know the the humans that are now experiencing the storm um, what else can I say um, yeah I suppose look that simile there that compares the wind to a madman chasing nothing is almost like a monster thrashing his tail about in a sense uh, which emphasizes the unpredictable nature of the storm, um, which adds to its destructiveness. Alright guys, so that is the storm, that is the storm, that is the African thunderstorm, and um, yeah, clearly I am quite tired and making stupid mistakes all the time. But I hope that's helped, and uh, good luck with your assessment.